because I flew in there to do a, a shoot a commercial and was just blown away by the scenery. And then, to my amazement, only a few years ago when I was looking into my father's background, my dad was with the, uh, the was, was with the Air Force. Um, <clears throat> and in fact, you know, I, I wasn't born until he was about 45. Um, and I knew a little bit about him because he'd gone to the First World War with the 7th Light Horse and fought off the back of a horse in Palestine for a while. And then, because he was quite a short man, he was seconded into um, the first uh, fighter squadron. So he spent the second part of the First World War um, fighting uh, in the air. Um, and then in between wars, uh, he was a planter in New Guinea and a private aviator and all the rest of it. But um, an aunt sent me, Dad died in the 70s, but an aunt sent me a whole bunch of stuff only a few years ago. And to my amazement, I found that he'd been born in Wellington. So I'm half New Zealand, and I'm very pleased about that. Um, and I followed up the story about why. And my grandfather, his father, had been a, a buyer of textiles. So um, he would sail around the world um, with his family, with his wife, and 10 children. My father had seven sisters and two brothers. Um, and they'd pull him to places like Bombay and they'd stay a couple of months and he'd buy up silk and things like that. And then come to Australia and then to New Zealand to buy wool, which eventually, of course, was all packed up and sent back to the mills in, in England. So that's why he, um, he, was, uh, he was born while they were here in, in, uh, in New Zealand. Um, as far as Star Wars is concerned, um, the story of my involvement was I'd been travelling with my wife and my two daughters, um, who were quite small at that time, uh, through places like Indonesia and, um, and Bali, and we were staying and, and sort of bumming around and enjoying travelling. And we ended up in London um, for a few months, and I had an agent in London, and one day she rang and she said, um, Peter, look, there's this um, strange little science fiction movie being shot out at um, Pinewood. She said there's a completely unknown director called George Lucas. Um, we don't know whether he's much good or not. Uh, but he's, she said, there's a couple of days work in it if you like it. And I said, oh, how much? Because we were broke, as usual. And she said, 60 pounds a day. I said, I'll take it. I had no idea what the part was or anything like that. I just needed the money. So I found myself out at Pinewood um, and uh, involved in this extraordinary, extraordinary film. At the time, we didn't know it was extraordinary. And I remember, in, because the scene I did was set in that control booth, control room, and I remember standing at the back. It was just a small studio. That part of it was against black curtains at the back and watching the, the technicians light the scene and the camera guys fixing up the cameras and doing all that sort of thing. And then I suddenly became aware of this guy that had come and stood beside me. And I looked at him and I thought, oh, he, he must be the accountant because he had these battered old grey trousers on, a, a sort of dirty white shirt with the sleeves rolled up, and his glasses were sort of cocked to one side and his hair was all over the place. And we got talking, and he um, he asked me where I was from, and I said I'm, I'm from Australia, and that you know got us talking. We talked about a few things, and then um, after about five minutes, the first assistant director sort of did this to him, and he said, "Oh, excuse me," and away he went. And then about ten minutes later, I was introduced to him, and it was George Lucas, <laughs> and. Um, because uh, you know, I had to be officially introduced, that's what happens, and we went ahead and did the scene. Um, and it, it was, uh, I, I just loved working because the guys that we were working with were obviously, you know, they were skilled English technicians, um, and they really knew what they were doing. And I, I, was, I was pleased to be doing it. what I, I began to realise was a, a, a good film. Um, because the work I'd done in Australia before, I'd, I'd done a, a series called Spy Force, and we, over two years we'd shot 40, 40 one-hour episodes, you know, that's like making about 13 movies. Um, so I knew what I was doing, and so I could relax and enjoy it. Um, and it went very smoothly. The only part that didn't go very smoothly was um, uh, 
uh, when we came to the scene where I get to the airlock door and press the button and the door goes up, it actually went up very slowly because of the, the way things were. And in the film, of course, they speeded it up. And there was um, R2-D2 and the Wookiee. And on the first take, and the Wookiee was um, uh, radio controlled. Of course, there's somebody, you know, it's not, not the Wookiee, R2-D2. Of course, C-3PO had a, a person inside and so did the Wookiee. Um, but C, but R2-D2 was radio controlled. So the first take, the door went up and R2-D2 spun around and shot back down the corridor. So, okay, set it all up again, bring the door down, take two. So the door went up, R2-D2 shot straight in and hit me and, and fell over. <laughs> So okay, set it all up again. So up with, and then the third take, the door went up. And this time R2, D2 shot past me and hit the camera. Because they, they really, you know, they were still experimenting. This was the first movie that was ever made and they were still experimenting and they had no idea, you know, what would work and what didn't. And it took us about 10 takes before they got R2, D2 to do exactly what was required and then the, the Wookiee knocked me, bang, and I went onto a mattress and that was the end of me. And I, I've always been happy that I wasn't actually shot or killed because I thought, well, maybe I can come back. <laughs> and I've even thought of asking my agent to call the casting people at, at uh, Disney and say, Peter wants another role, but, you know, who knows. Um, and it, it was quite extraordinary. Uh, in, in the breaks, I'd wander around the rest of the studio, and there was a massive um, main studio in which that, that spacecraft was that belonged to... Um, uh, Harrison Ford, and there it was, and um, uh, there was the you know the white guard that when I wave, he waves back and does all that. But I went down during the break, and uh, I was amazed at, at the construction of this thing, just extraordinary. And I also there was a in the in the middle of the floor, God, lights, camera, <laughs> action, in the middle of the floor, there was a sort of it looked like a a circular paling fence. And I, I, I can't remember if it appears in the film or not, or, or what, what function it had. But I strolled over, you know, during the tea break with my uniform on, and um, I thought, what is this? And I looked down and went, oh, God. I was looking down about three kilometers. It was like, you know, the machinery of the, of the starship or something was going down, 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 down. And then I, I thought, wait a minute, that's painted on the floor. And of course it was, and I looked very careful and thought, my God. Because you see, in those days, it was the end of the period when all of those sort of special effects were, were hand done. And some of those old Cockney guys who, who'd been with the studios for a hundred years, you know, oh, all right, darling, you know, you want a backdrop with a, a, a castle, I'll paint it for you, you know. So they, they've been employed. These amazing men, and they're all gone now, because you see, it's all done by special effects now. It's all computer-generated Im images. But then, for things like that, these guys got down on their knees and laboriously painted it. And it looked spectacular. But of course, those days are all gone now. And um, I was sad to see that, because some of those old codgers. I remember doing a, a film called Ned Kelly in, in 1969 in Australia, and the one that Mick Jagger played, Ned Kelly, God. Oh, oh dear. But um, they had to build the, the uh, right out near Canberra, they had to build a hotel where the big shootout was, where the police track the Kelly game. So they built it, you know, as, a, as an old, you know, 1880s type hotel wooden, and they put in the bar and they put the glass and the, the shelves and all the rest of it. And then um, one day, these two lovely old cottons turned up, same sort of guys from the same studio, and oh, hello, darling. No, they see you, yeah, all right. And I said to them, because I, I was on the set and watching the work going on, we weren't filming, they were filming somewhere else, I had a day off. Um, and I said, what, what are you going, because they just turned up, and they said, oh, we like this country, this is lovely, you know, all right. And their whole job, their only job, was to age the set. They'd been flown out from London, and that was their job. So they got to, to, to work with dirt, and with scratchy paint, and they'd scratch things, and they'd rub things, till the whole set, which, you know, when they built it out of new wood and everything, looked new. By the time that they'd finished after a couple of days, you could have sworn it with that, that hotel had been there for 50 years, because it was dust, and cobwebs, and mess, and all the rest of it. Um, but that's the sort of, that's the, and all that, I'm afraid, is gone now. 
it's all gone because this, it's all done now, everything like that with, with computer generated images. Um, so that was that was my my um, experience with um, with Star Wars. Um, I I I laughed because I got 120 pounds for it. People have said to me at times, "Oh, you must be so rich with all the years of royalties." No, no. Um, my, I was too small an actor, too small a part ever to get royalties, and I think I've spent about a hundred times what I earned on on a postage for people who for 40 years have been sending me photographs of things from around the world and saying, please, would you sign this and send it back to me? And I, I've done it. Um, and I must say, you know, I've, done, I've made a point of always doing that because early on I, I got a letter from a guy and he was obviously, you know, maybe 30s, 40, and he, he said in the letter, um, I've been ill and the old term would have been iron lung. One of those dreadful machines that people, you know, because they have some some sort of lung problem, they, they spend their lives lying in this wretched machine with a mirror there. Oh, I can't imagine. But his whole life had become Star Wars. And that's when I thought, oh, I've got to answer that. And I did. And made a point thereafter of every single letter that ever came to me over the years, I would respond to it because I thought to myself, you know, there are so many people out there who maybe written, their life has revolved around science fiction or, or Star Wars or Star Trek or something like that. Um, and I'm very, very glad I've done that. Um, you know, because it's like, I've come to realize over the years that Star Wars was something really special. It triggered something on them. And it's like, the people who follow Star Wars are interested, they're like one big family. And what I love about it too, is always looking to the future. It's looking to, to a positive future, even with the wars amongst the planets and all the rest of it. There's kind of something very positive about it. It's saying, you know, humanity is going to keep marching forward um, for tens of thousands of years. And I feel felt very privileged to have even had 30 seconds in such an amazing series of movies. Um, and I'd like to thank you all for coming and for, for your interest in it. Um, and may the force be with us all. Thank you. If anyone has any questions that they'd like to ask Peter, um, you, if you've got the cars to come down here and use the microphone, please. Or just, or just to want to shout, just, just shout us out if you have anything to ask. Please do. No, I've probably covered it all, haven't I? <coughs> <laughs> okay, well... Yes, um, what, what was your first... Um, can, you, can you reflect back to your first thought when you saw Darth Vader come out onto the set? Um, I, uh, astonishment. Absolute astonishment. Um, I didn't actually talk to him because he, he was due on set and at the time I was off. off I, I wasn't filming. So he was busy and you don't interrupt, you know. But I did, I did sit down in uh, Alec Guinness's chair and I felt quite moved about that because he'd always been a hero of mine. And I met Mark Hamill and, um, and Harrison Ford and they were, you know, I mean, they'd become, well, certainly Harrison, a huge movie star. Um, and, and so the, the sort of would be an aura, but in those days, he was just another actor. Certainly to me, you know, we were just a bunch of ordinary old actors who were doing this film that everybody thought was <laughs> Certainly the agents in London thought, oh, you know, do you really want to do this better? Yes, I need the 60 pounds. I've got two kids to feed. <laughs> um, but, you know, they were very obvious. I imagine, I don't know, um, I've not met any of them since, and of course Alec Guinness is gone, but he was always a very, um, certainly in my experience, he was just a genuine human being, you know, who was... Uh, like a lot of them like that, they just, they start out as maybe theatre actors and then they get into the movies and they, they develop a big international name and they're always kind of astonished by it because their, their, their heart and their life was in theatre which is always sort of like family, you know, you work with a group of people in the theatre and you come to kind of love them like family um, and you do a show which might last three or four months and then bang, everybody's gone. Um, so there was a kind of... Um, 
a level-headedness and, and innocence about all of us in that, in that, um, uh, you know, at that period. And I'm sure, from what I've heard anyway, you know, somebody like Harrison, he's become, you know, he, he is such a huge star that he's kind of drifted away from, from the rest of us, as it were. But that, that's what happens with fame and fortune, such as he's attained. But they were good people. And um, certainly when I first saw Darth Vader coming out, I thought, oh, that's when it first hit me, actually, that there's something different about this movie. Um, and um, and I, I, I certainly, because I'd never seen, see, I loved sci-fi when I was a kid, and I remember going to the movies and seeing uh, Forbidden Planet. You know that movie? Made in the 50s? And the lovely thing was that, that, that was it, um, oh, what's the name of the actor that was, because I worked Leslie with Nielsen. Leslie Nielsen, yeah, and I, I worked with him years later, to my amazement, on a film in Hong Kong and Singapore called Millions Will Die. And he, I thought, ah, I didn't, I, I'd forgotten. I said, oh, he's the guy in Forbidden Planet, you know, and that was 15 or 20 years before. Um, but that was, that was the film that triggered me off into interest in sci-fi. But when I look back, between uh, Forbidden Planet, which I think was about 1955, for the next 20 years, there were one or two sci-fi movies, but nothing, nothing as astonishing as when Star Wars came on. And I think Star Wars just blew the whole thing up, and ever since, it's become much bigger than I think anybody ever imagined. Yes, sir. It must have been quite exciting to have um, came out and became this huge thing. Oh, it was. Right. Exciting to be part of it. Yeah, it was. And, and we were back in Australia by that time. I, we'd, we'd, I'd been away travelling with my wife and two children um, for about six months, and we got back to Australia. And by that time, it, 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 uh, it, it was released. It had just been released, and the hype was amazing. And my, my agent said to me, Peter, for God's sake, get on a plane and go to Los Angeles. Um, and I really seriously thought about it because, you know, a, a small 30 seconds like I did, you can if you're in Hollywood, you can trade it up, particularly when the movie's just been released and everybody's excited. You can trade that into a career because the casting people say, oh, what, you were in Star Wars? Oh, okay, come and audition for this movie or that movie. But I just, my two kids were, my two daughters were, you know, that and that, and I thought, I don't want my children to be brought up in Hollywood. Because, you know, I've been there and worked there a few times and the values are so screwed. And uh, the thought of my children being educated in that, that atmosphere, that Los Angelian, that phony atmosphere, I couldn't bear it. I couldn't bear the thought. And I talked a lot with my wife about that and we decided no, no. You know, and I didn't want to go on my own because if, what's the point of going and settling and working there if my, my the people I love are back in Sydney. So I decided not to go. And I don't regret it um, because, you know, the values in Hollywood, even though amazing work comes out of there, when, you, when you're on the ground in there, um, man, I've, I've worked, with, I've, well, I've worked with, with people who grew up in there. In, I remember, um, I'm just trying to think of the Australian actor who went there in the late 40s, Michael Pate. And he, he did a lot of, he lived in Hollywood till he came back in the 70s. And his son, Chris, grew up and was educated in the Hollywood school. And I have to tell you that Chris was, he, you know, he, his values were completely stuffed. It was all surface. And that's Hollywood, Hollywood. Well, otherwise he wouldn't have made the billions that he's made and done what he's done. You have to be, you know, Hollywood is a cruel, cruel place. And, and to survive and do what he's done, I have great admiration for him um, because you know the forces against survival in, in Hollywood are extraordinary. The only and the only time you can ever do what you want is when you reach the top and you have the power and the money, like the top producers and the top studios and the top stars. That's the, you know uh, that's when you can do what you want. But that's the top of the, the pyramid. And the pyramid goes all the way down to all those people who are serving in hamburger shops and driving taxis and what. Everybody you meet in Hollywood is an aspiring actor and they're just waiting to be discovered. You know, whether they serve you fries or you drive your taxi or they, they are at the motel. 
they're all waiting to break into the big time. And unfortunately, probably, you know, one in a thousand ever makes it. And what happens to the rest, you know? They, their dreams die. So there's a very sad side to Hollywood, even though there's a wonderful side to it. Only Bruce is. So I knew how to, to take what, what, um, what he gave me. And I, I always remember on the final take when we got it, <laughs> That was Matthew, wasn't it? Matthew. 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 He ripped off the head and he said, oh, Christ, it's so f***ing hot. <laughs> he would, that, that, that suit is, was so, you could see, you know, he tore it off and the sweat's pouring down his face. And he was, after six takes, he was um, quite fed up, actually. I can imagine, but that you, you, you took that quite well. You sort of slammed into those barrels behind you and... Roll onto the floor. Oh yeah, they, 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 you rehearse it, of course. You know, you do it in slow motion, and, and so that the camera, because you've got to get the angles to the camera right, so that the, um, so there's a, you know, there's quite a lot of work before you actually do a take, where you you work out exactly what you're going to do, you know, which which hand you're going to hit with, because if you use, say, this, if the camera's there and you use this one, then you're blocking the camera, so you've got to change and use that one, and all those sort of little little details that you go into. Um, that, that make up a scene that works. Um, but yeah, I was glad when it was over and landed softly on the mattress and, and Peter Mayhew was glad when he tore his head off. <laughs> Imagine. The other thing I, I had mentioned to you a while back was um, like with the original costume that you wore, it didn't give you any uh, option to actually keep the... the, the no, I never even thought about it. Right. No, I mean, you know, it's funny with, with costume, you just... Um, did they have to take measurements from you or did they actually have a... a yes, a yes. I had to go to the, the studio about a week before and they took measurements and, and did all that. But, you know, you never... You know, certainly I've never considered taking home costume because it's like it's, you have a different attitude. The costume belongs to the character, not me. You know, and that goes back into the wardrobe department where they keep all those costumes. And I mean, sometimes funny things can happen. I remember with the Ned Kelly thing, um, one day at the very beginning of the film, about six or eight of these huge traveling baskets turned up um, from London. And what had, the producers had hired all the costumes, rather than getting them from local costumiers in Sydney, they brought them out from London. So we were pulling out all sorts of wonderful stuff that had the names of uh, actors from different productions that were still sewn into them. And my leather pants that I wore in that um, had, it, in the back it had the label Born Free and the, the star actor's name, I can't think of his name now, but the lead actor in that wonderful film about uh, the lion, you know, uh, Elsa the lion, Born Free. So that, <laughs> I was wearing in Ned Kelly the same pants that he was wearing in Born Free, you know. Yuck. Yeah. <laughs> I'm sure they'd been dry cleaned before. <laughs> Okay, does anyone else would like to ask Peter anything? Yes, sir. Yeah, in your scene, you just put a picture up behind you. The A, you throw off a kind of distinctive salute. I was just wondering if that was uh, your invention or uh, something that they'd shown. What, 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 what? Is the cameraman, is the... <laughs> it's very distinctive, it's both. It's next on the <coughs> screen. Yeah. Is that something that you... Oh, it's just, I, I just, as far as I remember, I just did that instinctively, you know. Sure. It's like I just copied. It's, we're sorry. <laughs> no, but that, I think I just did that automatically. You know, with the line, I said, "Oh, okay." You know, I'm just—it's like an ordinary salute. It's, I'm sure I didn't even think about it. I, I mean, it just came automatically. Those things seem tend to, you know, you 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 get into that sort of mindset. Okay, I'm a I'm a I'm an officer, um, and I'm on uh, I'm like a soldier. Uh, and I have to obey orders and do what I'm told and I probably have to salute the superior officer. So you, you just kind of build those things in and you know, they come automatically. But that's something that I actually was going to ask you as well about that I didn't know that it was something that you were directed to do or no. something came up. No. Okay. In fact, see, this is what was interesting about, about um, George Lucas. He didn't direct. I think it's because he'd made one film before and what I noticed was that he obviously had had virtually no experience with actors because he was he was um, uncomfortable with 
you know, uh, it was mainly this, the, the DOP, the director of the photography, the guy who is in charge of the camera, who was the one who positioned us. Um, I never got any direction, and I noticed nobody else did. No, you know, a lot of directors will come up and say, now, no, no, Peter, I want you to be really angry in this and um, uh, do this and do that and see, see, you know, get this attitude going and, you know, why this, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, often that happens with directors. They'll come up to you very quietly. Um, some of the more dictatorial ones will say, no, I want you to walk through the door that way, you know. Don't do that, do this, etc. But he didn't do anything like that. But I think that was down to the lack of experience. Because he'd only made one film before. I think that was called, was it called Duel? That was that was Spielberg. Uh, oh, that was Spielberg, that's, yeah. that's right, yeah. I think it would have probably been uh, American Graffiti, I think. American Graffiti, yeah. that's right, yeah. Um, so, uh, you know, I, I was a bit surprised by that because normally directors are very hands-on and they, you know, you, you listen to them and do what they ask. Um, unless you're a very big star when <laughs> you ignore them and do what you want to do. <laughs> I think the young girl up back there, you had a question for Peter? Yes, darling. Um, what did it feel like to be in a movie? Like, with cameras all around and what? Um, it, it can be very scary. Uh, and one of the, one of the it, it, it takes a while. Luckily, you see, I'd had a lot of experience working on the Spy Force television series. So I got used to, um, uh, uh, you know, in a scene when it all closes down and the doors are closed and the first assistant director, who's the one who bosses everybody around, says, all right, all right, everybody quiet, all right, line up, everybody ready. What you realize, particularly if, 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 if it's a, what they call a single, in other words, it would be a shot on me alone. You realize that everybody in the studio is focused on you, are staring at you. And that can be quite confronting. And certainly when I first began working in front of a camera, it was very hard to deal with because I became very self-conscious, you know, I thought, oh, you know. And it was hard, I had to say, no, no, Peter, forget, forget yourself, be the character, be the character. And it's quite nerve-wracking to begin with, to find everybody staring at you. And you realize that if you stumble or make a mistake, you know, it's so obvious. Um, you can't hide it, you can't hide. When you're in front of a camera in a scene like that, there's nowhere to run. You just can't hide. And if you think you're doing a bad job, you know, I've, I've walked away after the director said cut, and I've gone away into the dressing room and just broken down and cried because I thought I was so awful. You know, and, 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 and but it's, it, it is, but you do get used to it. And you learn, what you learn to do is cut off. Um, you always, with, a, with film work, you always have to be aware of where the camera is, you know. Um, you know if, if the camera, say, is, is here, and it's taking a two shot of Sean and myself, I've got to be careful not to sort of, you know, do that, otherwise, I, I, all you get is the back of me and I block Sean. So even though I, I have to pretend the camera isn't there, I also have to be very aware of it and, and make sure that I don't uh, mask Sean or, or you know, sc screw the shot up in some way. But you, you get used to it. That's, that's part of what they call technique. Technique is just learning all the tricks and, of the trade of working in front of a camera, including, uh, you know, um, for those actors and actresses who are very vain, including which side is the best side, you know. Shall I show this side to the camera, or this, you know? <laughs> and there are some very narcissistic, <laughs> very vain actors and actresses, I can tell you, and a lot of very insecure ones, too. Okay, so any other questions for Peter? Yes, sir. Yeah. Um, what are your views on the remastered versions of Star Wars, you know, with all the extra Eek. special effects? Do you think it was a good thing, or do you think it was a bad well, thing? Well, I think that this, is, this seems to be something that, that people fall on one side or the other. One of the things that I've noticed over the years is people have said to me, they liked Episode 4 best of all, because it was had the most flesh and blood in it. Do you know what I mean? It was the one that felt most human. Whereas the further he got down the line with the, with the other ones, the more enamored he became of, of the special effects and the, 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 the mechanics and the machinery and the people and their 
feelings and their flesh and blood, as it were, sort of receded a bit in the background. And people have said that the most human of all of them, they felt, was the first one, which is number four in the series. So it's hard to know. I mean, I think that, that the film was, was improved by the additions. Um, but also, I think that it tended to lose something, too. And I'm, I'll be interested, very interested, to see what happens with the new episodes that come up. Because I think, I think with you know, a, a CGI, computer-generated images, the whole thing has become so amazing over the last 20 years that I think some producers, some directors, have gone so deep into it that it's what we're watching on, on screen has really little to do with human beings. And, and it's what has to do with human beings that attract the audience. It's, you, know, you, you feel for Princess Leia, you feel for, for Harrison Ford, and, and, and that's what, what's gripping you. Uh, it's fascinating to watch the sort of, the, the, the odd, the, the strange characters or the machinery, but they don't necessarily uh, bring about an emotional response in you. That emotional response comes from your feelings for and about the human beings in the movies. Um, so, I don't know, I'm not sure what to feel about that. Um, but I think that, um, I just hope they don't bury the humanity under the special effects. Okay, anybody else? So, okay. Yeah, just when you said, like you did the two days in London or in England, and then you kind of didn't think much about it, and you came back <coughs> from Australia and just got on with life. Yep. Like when it when it came out, it was so massive. Cause I remember that in like '77, especially yeah. for kids. With your kids, did they like? Oh yeah, yeah, my dad's in that. Was that like big for them, or oh, did yeah. people believe them? Oh yeah, look, it was very big for them. And because I tended to get, you know, even with my silly little thirty seconds, I tended to get a lot of publicity when it came out because I was the only Australian actor in Star Wars, and that got me quite a lot. You know, I didn't ask for it; it just came to the press and the people pretty quickly that I was the only Aussie in it. So that developed. But I, I, um, but the kids were, were thrilled. They loved it. And, and my second marriage um, to Linda, by whom I have a son who turned 30 a couple of weeks ago, Luke, um, people say, Is he, uh, after Lucas? And I said, well, maybe. <laughs> but when Luke was about eight or nine or 10, uh, the, the movie was reissued. You know, we talked about that reissue, and we took him to the cinema to see it because he wanted to, and it was a packed house, and it was the beginning. And when I came on the screen, my beloved little son leapt to his feet and shouted, "That's my dad!" <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, they've been they've been they've been fans of it. Yeah, but see, they know all about all the other work that I've done too. And as I joke, you know, nobody will remember the plays and television and other films I've done. What will be on my gravestone is TK421, do you copy? <laughs> <laughs> and, sir, what other TV um, projects have you been in? Oh, God. Um, wow. Well, of and course, the thing that, that kicked um, an actor called Jack Thompson and myself off was the Star Wars, uh, it was the Spy Force series, which we worked on for two years. But I did a lot of work for the, a lot of television work for the ABC. Um, uh, and that, a lot of that was kind of local stuff, you know, um, David Williamson dramas and things like that. Uh, I, I, I've done a few, it's, do you know I lose track of them? I did, uh, not long ago, I did, um, a, a, it was a three-part mini-series, uh, Moby Dick. And Patrick Stewart from Star Trek played, um, played uh, Ahab. And that, that was very good, I really enjoyed it. And a, a, a wonderful international director called Frank Rodden came out and, and directed that. Um, oh God, uh, you know, there were series like uh, Over There, which was a 26 part series about um, uh, New Zealanders and Aussies at war in Greece. Um, there was a series called Certain Women, which ran on for forever, um, were just about a family. Um, I was headmaster of Heartbreak High for a couple of years. <laughs> that, that series, yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, and a lot of sort of one-off television and trilogies and things like that. But, I mean, you know, you, you talk about when working with Patrick, Patrick was wonderful. You know, there he was with his bald head and, and, and all the rest of it. And he had a, we shot that down right on the waterfront in Melbourne 
because they had a ship, one of those infinity pools, you know, where the, if you, if you come down to a low angle, the water's right up to it. So if you look right out, it would appear as though the ship, which was more there, was right up, was in the sea. But um, Patrick, uh, the, main, the main leads were either English or a couple of Australians or Americans. And one of the things that was really interesting was Patrick, even though the conditions were absolutely bitter, it was freezing cold, it rained, it, there was mud everywhere, Patrick never complained. You know, he'd stand there for hours while they lit him and did all that stuff. And we had a scene, I played Captain Gardner, and there's a scene from the book too where the two ships pass, Ahab's ship and Captain Gardner's. And um, Gardner has lost his son. His son is out on one of the longboats, you know, going for whales, but it's lost. And Gardner's sailing his ship all over, trying to find his own son. And he comes across Ahab's boat, and, and they sail past, and he shouts, you know, uh, uh, please help me, help me, help me find my son. And Ahab, you know, he's obsessed. No, have you seen the white whale? Have you seen the white whale? And I'm saying, I don't care about the white whale. Will you help me find my son? Um, and we did this, uh, it, it looks amazing on, on, on film, but um, if you can imagine a concrete wharf and the pool runs from the edge of the concrete wharf to the edge and then if you go down low it looks right out and it's as though the sea. And then they build the boat, it was a full size ship in the pool and it was underneath, it was on uh, hydraulics. Um, to make it, you know, do all that stuff at sea. And the first part of the, of the scene, they shot me on board the ship, walking as I'm shouting, I have to, because the ships are passing, I'm trying to keep up, so I'm walking along the ship past my crewmen and shouting at him. And he's actually on the wharf on a, a, a wooden structure so that he's up about as high as I am. And the camera's behind him in the first scene, so it's over his shoulder. As, as he's shouting to me, and you see me walk along, you know, shouting to him, can you help me? He's saying, no, no, you, and so And then we swap places, and he gets on the ship, they redress the ship, so with different sails and different things to make it look like his ship, and then I'm up on the thing, that's over my shoulder, and when it cuts together, it works perfectly. But one of the things I noticed that, um, you know, this was, that it was bitterly cold, and, and when, Patrick was on the ship and I was up here with a coat around me or I had to take it off because it was over my shoulder and I could see the uniform I was wearing or the, the period clothes I was wearing. Um, and uh, there were pauses every now and then and Patrick would stay in his place but his, most, his mate and his bosun were two, I can't think of their names, but they were two middle ranking uh, American TV stars and nothing was ever right. You know, they didn't have big roles. Patrick was the star. But they were bitching about the cold coffee. And, uh, you know, I asked for a chair 10 minutes ago. Where is it, you know? And this coffee stinks. Can't you bring me some decent coffee? Bitch, complain, bitch, complain. <laughs> you know, and it, it struck me that, that you know, I've you know, I, I worked with some heavy and, and big people. And it's funny, the bigger they are, the more modest they are. It's the ones that are halfway down, like these middle-ranking TV stars who would like to be as famous and whatnot as Patrick, but they just, they get to be bitchy. And I didn't like that at all. And the funny thing with that too is when, when, we, when we rehearsed it, well, we, we, we rehearsed it um, uh, with, because also the, the, of Patrick, there were wheels underneath the structure that Patrick was on so that he was moving that way while I was moving that way. And, and, and we rehearsed the lines, you know, while they were sitting up on camera with me shouting and whatnot. And then we, we set it up for the take. And I started at the back end of the boat. And so everything's ready, you know, everyone's quiet, all right, everybody's in position, camera ready, you know, okay. Action. And I stepped off. And suddenly the floor dropped away and I went straight down on my face because they hadn't told me and we hadn't rehearsed the hydraulics. And suddenly the boat is pitching. And I'm like, ah, God. <laughs> so they had to let me practice walking on a deck that was going like that a couple of times before I could do it properly and before we could take the tape. <laughs> Silly stuff. <laughs>
Sounds like a lot of fun. Anyone else any questions? Yes, yes, my dear. Um, how was Star Wars created? How was what? Star Wars created. How was Star Wars created? Yeah. Well, I think what what happens is obviously. Um, it's a big question, isn't it? It is a good question. It's one I have to think about. But the way a film like that would start would be George Lucas. Obviously, it came from him. And what he'd do is he would get this idea. He wants to make a, a, a film like has never been made before, a science fiction film, because he loves science fiction. So he has to sit down with a writer or two and start to work out a story. You know, what's the story about? You know, you can't just say, oh, let's have some rockets and some this and that. So he has to work out a story about, you know, um, Princess Leia and, and, and who Harrison Ford is and who Mark Hamill is and, and the whole business of the, of the different, uh, uh, different um, sorts of people who are at war with one another. And you have to think about what's happened in the last two or three hundred years and all of that. And you gradually, with the help of a writer, you write the story of, of the characters, the main characters, what's going to happen to them, and how they get into trouble, and then how they save themselves, and how it all ends, ends up. And then, once that script is written, then they have to sit down with all the special effects people, and the model makers, and the designers, and say, okay, how do we make this look? We've got to invent, we've got to invent spaceships, We've got to invent what's inside the spaceship. What do the rooms look like? What are the what are the control rooms look like? What are the sort of uniforms of people? What are the what are the stormtroopers wear and whatnot? And then then everyone goes away, and the, the people who design the stormtroopers' costumes and costumes like this they start drawing and making drawings, and they bring the drawings back to George Lucas, and he says, "Yes, I like that." That's terrific. No, that doesn't work. Go away and do it again. So they end up with masses of drawings that go with the script. And then, and then after that, um, uh, uh, once, they, once they, then what they do is they take that to the producers, like 20th Century Fox, and they say, this is the movie we want to make. Here's the script. This is all the characters. This is what happens to them. And these are all the drawings. All, the, all the, the spaceships and the interiors and the exteriors and all the rest of it. And, the, and, the, the, um, and then in come the people who cost it. They sit down and they say, well, this is going to take us six weeks to build. You know, we'll need 20 builders and we'll need all this material. So that's going to cost $100,000. And then, then they say, oh, all these costumes, you know, all the plastic and whatnot. We've got to mold that. So that means, you know. Sorry. So they cost the whole thing. And then once all that's done, they all sit down together around a huge table and they say, can we do this? Is this possible? And then if the producers say, yes, we'll take the risk because we don't know what this is going to be like because we've never made a film like Star Wars before. And then somebody says, the big boss says, okay, what do you need? Do you need $100 million? Okay, we'll risk that. And they, then they, they, what they say is they green light the project. In other words, they say, go. And then everybody starts building. And they start casting the actors and they build the sets and they make the costumes. And that's how it all slowly, slowly comes together. It's like a big jigsaw done. And they slowly bring it all together. Hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of people whose job it is to end up with, with wonderful films like Star Wars. That's the condensed version. <laughs> that's the condensed version. The long version would take me three weeks. <laughs>